Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. Hey, everybody. Well, I'm really excited for today's episode. And there are so many potential roads into the conversation. Maybe the straightest one possible is that, as many of you know, I'm working on a book tentatively titled A Good History of Shit Jobs that examines the U.S. economy and work from about 1980 to 2020, including topics like globalization and technological change. And part of that story is what we know and debates about how the adoption of computers has changed the way organizations work, how organizations do what they do, and how this has affected both the kinds of jobs available and the nature of those jobs, what people do all day. This topic turns out to be extremely controversial because Though it may seem like computers provide obvious benefits, accounting for what those benefits are turns out to be really, really difficult. Because of this book work of mine, and for other reasons, which have to do mostly with me being a complete and hopeless nerd, I've become very interested in how scholars in the humanities and social sciences began in the 1980s to study how organizations were adopting computers and other technologies. And among other things, I hope to do a series of podcast interviews with some of those scholars. The first such interview was the one with Joanne Yates about her book, Control Through Communication, some episodes back. And so you can think of this episode as part two, a conversation about a lifetime spent doing technology studies with the great scholar Steve Barley, who is Professor Emeritus at both Stanford University and the University of California, Santa Barbara. Another road into this episode has to do with peoples and things, my class on technology studies that eventually led to the creation of this podcast. When I started putting together that class, I was looking for materials on technology adoption which is a hugely important topic in thinking about technology in general. The effects and impacts of technologies come less from their invention and initial design and more from how people adopt them and come to use them in daily life. What I found was that there are very few studies of technology adoption in the narrowly construed field of science and technology studies. I thought this was bananas and I still do. I was stumbling around in life hoping someone would help me out, and then I happened upon Barley's classic 1986 article, Technology as an Occasion for Structuring, Evidence from Observations of CT Scanners and Social Order of Radiology Departments. I was so excited about and benefited so much from this paper, which ended up opening a whole world of literature for me including not only Barley's own work, but eventually work by his colleagues, such as Diane Bailey, and his students like Paul Leonardi, two people I hope to also have on the podcast someday. Barley has written about so many interesting topics, not only a whole series of papers on technology adoption, but also pieces on the ideology of organizations and entrepreneurship, the work lives of those maintainers called technicians, about email as a source of and symbol of stress, and more generally about bringing work into organizational studies and how to relate studies of information technology and studies of organizations. In this interview, which I did in the spirit of an oral history interview, Steve and I revisit the 40-year arc of his career, which has had an enormous influence on so many people doing technology studies today. I had a wonderful time talking to Steve. I think you'll see that. Hey, get excited. Steve, thanks 
so much for taking the time to join me today, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So, Steve, I do want to what I really want to do in this interview is just kind of tell people your story. As I've told you, I'm 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 really interested in folks who started studying computers and technologies entering organizations in the 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I want to get at your story. And so I really like to just start from the beginning. Like, you know, where'd you grow up and what was what was your family background and all that kind of stuff? Oh, wow. OK, well, yeah, we're doing it, man. I grew up in uh, Winchester, Virginia, which is at the northern end of uh, Shenandoah Valley. Oh, really? And, uh, yep. And uh, yeah, same state where you are right now. Yeah, I love the Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Almost West Virginia, but not quite. OK. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> My dad uh, didn't finish high school, and uh, so his job was um, uh, he worked for the Ralston Farina Company, and he ran feed stores okay. in Manchester. And for a while, from the time I was a senior in high school to the time I was maybe a junior in college, <laughs> he went to Maryland to to run a chicken farm, which Whoa. had... A quarter of a million chickens. <laughs> oh. And it provided eggs to all the A&P stores. At least there were A&P stores then. And I don't know whether it still exists or not, but A&P had, was a grocery store chain, and he, this, this farm provided eggs to all the A&P stores in Baltimore. Okay. My mom was a, was a hairdresser. And um, so actually, I'm the first kid in my family to ever go to college. I am a first gen, which... I've discovered is kind of rare for like um, Caucasians these days. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and professors I think too, especially. So, and then you you got uh you got a degree in English if I remember correctly, yes, and that's then you, correct. you got like a master's in like student personnel management or something like that. Administration. Right? <laughs> administration right so what led you then you were doing that i, I if i remember from your cv you, you were doing that for a second and then you decided to go to the sloan school of management and do organization studies so yeah, like yeah, what, yeah. what yeah. happened well as an english major i thought i was going to teach high school and so i would student taught in this high school and very quickly figured out that my job was not to teach my job was to control and i really didn't like that very much yeah like controlling children so here I am in the second quarter of my senior year going, what the hell am I going to do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a depression. It was a recession, rather. So jobs weren't plentiful. So what do you do in a recession? Smart people go back to school. Uh-huh. <laughs> so since I didn't have any plan, I looked around and said, okay, what am I going to do? And I saw that there were all these counseling types in the residence halls at William & Mary. So um, I said, well, I think I could do that. That'd be a lot of fun. So I applied to Student Personnel Administration um, programs got it but ohio state decided it would pay my way huh and so i went to ohio state did student personnel administration and during that i took a course in organizational sociology huh. and discovered that i like that a lot better than psychology in fact because I could kind of relate to social systems in a way, or think about social systems in a way that I couldn't think about constructs that psychologists use to talk about motivation or personality, yeah, or, you know, yeah. whatever you have, it, right? So, um, after I went to work for Cornell University the first time as a residence hall director, after two years, I realized that this really wasn't the career for me, and but I just was still reading organizational sociology for fun. Oh, interesting. And organizational development for fun. And so I figured, okay, why not go do a PhD? At the time, I was trying to make a choice between the PhD and doing an apprenticeship in carpentry. And (laughs) I ultimately decided that if I really wanted to do carpentry, I could do it as an avocation. But there was no way I could ever be a researcher as an avocation. So uh-huh. I chose to go to graduate school. I applied a bunch of places. Um, MIT turned out to be uh, the most compatible, although I didn't think it was going to be at first because it was like, you know, core of the industrial, military industrial yeah, complex, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, didn't think, I didn't think it was going to be the place for me to begin with, but it turns out that compared to Harvard and the other schools that I applied to, 
the MIT people were just much nicer and much interesting, uh, much more reasonable, and um, <laughs> and also, you know, I would say in in some way a little smarter. <laughs> 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 Take that, Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're you're bringing up not wanting to control kids, and then uh, the military industrial contracts. I was gonna, I was trying to figure out where I'd bring this up, and we, we might as well go there now. So, I think another thing that a lot of people know about you is that you're a deadhead. Yeah, right. So, when did, when did that start? Was that already going on in college? Had you already gotten into them, or? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, in high school, I had okay. a friend named Pat Moley. And Pat and I used to trade records to each other. So one of the first things I did, like when I started hmm. making my own money at 15, was I joined the Columbia Record Club. Okay. I don't know whether you've ever heard of the Columbia Yeah, Record yeah, Club I, I, okay. I was still joining things like that when I was a kid. Okay, yeah. so I joined the Columbia Record Club, and I would, I would order albums, right? And, yeah. and I, at this point in time, right, this is like 1968, 1969, and stuff is, you know, good music is just coming out, and... So I would just buy albums, buy bands that sounded cool. And I don't mean the music, I mean their names, right? Right, I, right. I couldn't hear them on the radio where I live because um, I didn't have a radio strong enough to bring in DC FM stations. So, but Pat Mulvey, this guy I knew, was into records too. So we would exchange records with each other. And so around 1907, he brought me Working Man's Dead. And that was it. That was it, huh? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> And did you start like following him around and stuff? I mean, did you really? Well, get into no, that it? didn't start happening until about three or four years later. Okay. Um, went to William Mary in the fall of 1971, and in the fall of 1973, well, before that, there were a couple guys on my hallway, my freshman hallway, that were deep into the dead. So we started listening to everything. We bought all the older albums, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1973, they played William Mary Hall. And, of course, I went to see them. And um, the first night, after the end of the show, they announced that they were coming back the next night. And they were going to take all the chairs off the floor. <laughs> and there was going to be a dance with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and none of this had been announced, right, ahead of time. So, so the second night, the only people who knew the second night was happening were people who'd been there the first night. Uh, and since most of the people who were there the first night couldn't get back the second night, <laughs> there was a dance with the Grateful Dead with about 3,000 people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so then I started going to see shows elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've gone, you know, I've driven maybe 100 miles to see okay. the Dead, a couple hundred miles. But I was never like one of these guys that like follow them around from – show to show to show to show to show yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but i would see them wherever i had the opportunity to see them and that's been true ever since 1973 <laughs> right on man so so you were that kind of guy during that time um and so then you landed you landed at mit yeah and um so who i mean who was around then and who were you know who were you influenced by and who were who were you working closely with at that time who were your advisors well, my chair was John Van Manning. Um, John was um, – I didn't know John when I applied to MIT. I didn't know anything about him. Uh, I applied to MIT because Ed Schein was there and Dick Beckhart was there. And at the time, I actually thought that what I was going to pursue was a PhD and then become an organizational development – no, consultant. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to MIT and um, – but maybe the second night we were there, they had a they had a reception uh, for the incoming class, which constituted me and a guy named Gib Dyer, who teaches at BYU now. And um, here was this guy, John Van Manen, and Van Manen had long hair like I had at the time, and he he had blue jeans on and a t-shirt, and um, and I started talking to him. <laughs> and it turns out he was an ethnographer, which you know I never really heard of. And that he had studied the cops. So he had gone to a city on the West Coast and um, went to the police academy and literally became a cop and then did a beat for about a year and then came back and wrote a dissertation 
on police organizations and police culture and so on. And he, you know, he's written, excuse me, over the years. Did that become a book, his dissertation? Uh, never a book, but a okay. ton of papers. Okay. And then okay. He, he, probably his most famous book is called Tales of the Field, okay. which is a book about doing ethnography. Hmm. But anyway, that's how I became an ethnographer. So I worked closely with John. On my committee was Ed Schein, who uh, was, a, was a social psychologist and uh, quite well known for his studies of career, and um, and he was also did OD. Um, but mostly he's known for careers. And he wrote his first book was called Coercive Persuasion, which I think is his best book. Hmm. Uh, it was a study of soldiers in who had been captured by the North Koreans and their experiences in Chinese prison camps. Huh. And he documented the process by, through interviews with these guys. He documented the process by which um, they were brought to essentially make anti-American statements. Hmm. And through this whole process, he actually developed a theory of socialization which he argues were, is not all that different from what some organizations do, like the army or the police force do to uh, newcomers when they bring them into the organization. So hmm. he developed a whole theory of adult socialization based hmm. on this stuff. I, it's a really good book, Course of Persuasion. I recommend it highly. Okay. So he was on my committee, and then Dorothy Leonard Barton was another member of my committee. And she left MIT to go teach. She she she's back up. She was a specialist in technological innovation. Okay. Um, she also worked kind of as an anthropologist in the, before she became an academic uh, in Indonesia, and knew a lot about you know, Balinese puppets and so on and so. Okay. on. Okay. And then she went to Stanford and worked with um, um, Everett Raw. Everett Rogers is this guy. Yeah. I got the first name right. Yeah, yeah, you do. Did, the the did diffusion sort of innovation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so she did that kind of stuff, and she did innovation. And she left MIT to go teach at Harvard, and uh, she wound up, uh, for the rest of her career, she stayed at Harvard. Uh, so that was my committee. The other person who was not on my committee but had a major influence on me, uh, as much prob as almost as much as John, uh, was a guy named Tom Allen. Hmm. And Tom studied uh, scientists, uh, mostly engineers, and R&D operations. Hmm. And I taught, I, stu I was a TA for Tom. Um, he taught in a number of classes. And one of the classes that he taught was, I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically sociology of science that he taught to MBAs who were interested, who were going to go out maybe and work for engineering corporations. Oh, fascinating. And, you know, so I was reading Merton, and I was reading the Coles, and I was, you know, all kind of the you know, 60s and early 70s yeah. uh, sociology of science, because um, the new sociology of science with Bloor and those guys, right? Mulcahy, um, and, so, and, and Scott, you know, Trevor Pinch's work, and Beaker's right. work, that had not come out yet. That right. would only come out a couple of years later. And so I was reading this stuff, and I got really interested in it. And I went to Tom one day, and I said, you know, Tom, I can find all this stuff on scientists. But there's hardly anything on engineers and almost nothing on, on technology uh, from a sociological perspective. Mm -hmm. And Tom said, well, that's because there isn't any." <laughs> okay. Well, that answers that question that I was going to ask you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, oh, this is pretty cool, right? So yeah. this is this is like if he's right, it's a totally empty niche. Uh huh. And if an academic can find an empty niche, they're, yeah. they're like totally golden because no matter what they say, it's a contribution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. Oh, that yeah, helps yeah. me too, historically. So, um, you know, I was going to ask you, like, how, you know, your first piece published, if I, if I got this right, is the semiotics of funeral work, yeah. right? And so I, a part of my question was, you know, how do you get from that to studying the role of 
technology and organizations. But it sounds like you were kind of already teed up to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the funeral director thing happened because I took this course from Van Manen and all the other PhD students had. Well, he was teaching what was called Introduction to Organizations or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And all the PhD students had to take it. So did so did uh, so did and some of the um, some of the MBAs took it too. Mm -hmm. But at this point, John had us read some stuff by James Bradley, and then asked us to go out and do a field interview. And I don't know whether you've ever read Spradley, but it's it's basically linguistic anthropology or what sometimes is called cognitive anthropology. And I thought it was pretty cool. And um, I figured, well, if I'm going to do this, I really want something that's thick with an, occup an occupation or a setting that's thick with symbolism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, funerals, they don't get much better than that. And there that was <laughs> there was a Catholic funeral director like a block and a half from where I lived. <laughs> So I went up and asked this guy if I could interview him, and um, and he said yes. And um, I did this first ethnographic interview with him, and then I thought, oh my god, you know, why stop here? <laughs> right? I had this. Yeah. Uh, I had the second year research paper uh, requirement, and this was the first quarter of my first year, or first semester of my first year, and I thought, well, this is. Do some more. Let's just hang with this guy for a while. Do an ethnography of this funeral home. Write it up as my second year paper, which I did. And then I started trying to publish this stuff. And um, I published two papers. One in a journal called Urban Life, which is now called Contemporary so uh, Contemporary Ethnography. And um, and one turned out uh, to get published in the Administrative Science Quarterly. Right. That's right. Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> Which is a big deal for those, like, yeah. A yeah, really big deal, right? Especially for a grad student, right? No shit. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was, like, really rare, like, totally yeah. rare. My, I mean, my, my faculty were, just, like, blown away. <laughs> and it was in a special issue on organizational culture. And at that point in time at MIT, there was a lot of interest in organizational culture. Ed Schein yeah. was writing a book on it. And so I was able to make a – so I wrote about semiotics as a way of thinking about how you think about what culture is. Mm -hmm. How can you study what culture is? If culture is cognitive, how can you think about studying it? Mm -hmm. And this was a great paper because I got to – I probably spent two or three pages talking about the role of metaphors and metonymy. <laughs> Using the Grateful Dead <laughs> and Deadheads as an example, <laughs> so I've also have the have the um, have the honor of being probably the first person to ever get the Grateful Dead into the Administrative <laughs> Science Quarterly. There we go. <laughs> I knew it would come back around. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, and so then I want to like I want to go towards. Uh, your article, Technology is an Occasion for Structuring, mm. soon, I mean, which is a huge article. I mean, it's been cited nearly 5,000 times. I mean, it's a big deal. Did that come out of your dissertation work or was that? That was the like, first paper out of my dissertation. Okay. So what led to that? I mean, tell explain a bit about uh, what it is and, and, you know, how you got there. Well, I did the study of uh, medical imaging technologies and I was very interested in comparing uh, computerized modalities like ultrasound, CT scanning. Today, that would include um, uh, magnetic resonance, resonance imaging, which, by the way, was called nuclear magnetic resonance when I was doing the study, but they changed the name because patients were freaked out by the word <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> yeah, I bet they did. <laughs> but at any rate, so I was interested in comparing these newer technologies that use computers to, uh, to construct images and older technologies like fluoroscopy and x-rays. Now, how I got there was back to Tom Allen, right? So I decided I'm going to study the impact of technology on professionals. And I started off thinking, okay, I think I'll study CAD systems because CAD was just coming out then. Yep, and it was beginning to be. It was certainly being used by engineers, 
and beginning to be used by architects. Yeah, surveyors so, and such. Yeah, exactly. So um, I started talking to some architects and discovered that almost none of them had CAD, and those that did didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a perfect right, technology do, story, right there. CAD, too. right? Yeah. <laughs> so then I decided, okay, I'm gonna st I'm gonna study artificial intelligence. <laughs> uh huh. And this was back when artificial intelligence was not machine learning. It was, you know, expert systems. Right. And I started looking around for expert systems. And I found some. Uh, one of them I remember was Myosin, which was developed at Stanford and um, was used to study uh, sepsis and what, uh, what bacteria were causing what kinds of diseases. And, you know, what I really wanted was some settings where these tools were being used in everyday medical practice. And I discovered that at that point in time, the only doctors that were using these systems were the doctors that they were modeled on. And I thought, well, this is not a very this is this is not going to give me a very good picture of reality. So yeah, so I'm not interested in that. And then I tried. <laughs> How, you're going to have a long interview here, man. So, <laughs> so, then, so then I tried. Um, what else did I try next? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, I don't remember what it was. Isn't that interesting? There was anyway, another thing, though, yeah. Yeah, but I don't remember what it was. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so, oh, I know. I went to do CAD with engineers uh. and discovered. I couldn't figure out what the engineers were doing. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, this is going to take me like two or three years just to get up to the speed with where I understood what engineers were doing, so I can't do that. So now I was depressed, right? Because I really wanted to study computer technologies and the impact on some profession. Yeah. Because no one, no one was writing about this, right? And somebody told me to go see the guy who was head of, and I don't remember his name, uh, who was the head of, basically medical, what we now call medical informatics mm -hmm. at Mass General. Okay. So I went to Massachusetts General Hospital and talked to this guy. He said, well, you know, if you really want to know where computers are having the biggest impact on, um, on medicine, it's radiology. <laughs> I thought, really? Those, those don't look like computers to me. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that's how I made it to radiology. Hmm. And so, did you go? You went there and you did ethnography there. Is that was the? Was I did it? ethnography in two. That's right. Yeah. Community hospitals. Um. Out one. Well, both of them were in Boston. Um. This was a time when there was something called the certificate of need process, which was a government regulation that basically said, um, "We don't think." CT scanners are really expensive, and we don't think there should be a proliferation of these scanners, right? Instead, we should be allocating these, spanner, these scanners across physical space in ways to optimize the number of people that have access to them without making them, um, um, without wasting money yeah. on so that everybody in hospital, everybody's hospital wants one, right? So we're going to control who gets them. So it turns out that out of this certificate of need process, there are four hospitals in the state of Massachusetts that were allowed to get CT scanners that year. One of them is in Worcester. And that was just too far to go every day for field work. Yeah. I, I just couldn't do that. So that left three. One of them, fortunately, was like four blocks from my house. <laughs> so I went up and talked to those guys, and they wouldn't let me in. And it, it, uh, I, didn't, I didn't find out why they wouldn't let me in for, um, for several years when finally one of the radiologists that I did get in, whose, whose hospitals I did get into, told me, well, you know, right, these guys tried to skirt the certificate of need process like two years earlier. And they probably thought you were a journalist coming to find out, <laughs> you know, if if they were playing it below the radar again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but still, it took me forever to get in the other two hospitals, huh. and um, and I, I I don't exactly know why, um, but at any rate, it, it, 
after six to seven months of talking to these guys routinely and waiting for them to return phone calls because never got returned, I decided that, well, I'm never going to graduate unless I do something. Right? <laughs> so I went to uh, Brigham and Women's Harvard's Hospital and started observing scanner operations there. Now, the problem with that was that scanner had been in operation for a long time, relatively long time at that point. So any changes that had taken place had already occurred. Mm -hmm. But it did give me, it did give me um, experience with CT scanning before I went out to the other two. And the most important thing that happened was uh, maybe two or three months into this work at Brigham and Women's, the, the chief of radiology said, well, you know, how are you coming with these other two hospitals? And I said, well, you know, they're not returning my calls. I don't think I'm going to get in, blah, 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 blah. Well, he says, you know, Dr. X from one of the hospitals is going to be coming up here to learn how to, uh, to do scanning. And I'm going to talk to him. And so this guy talked to that guy. And then apparently word went out through the radiology network to the second hospital that I had been cleared. By the right, chief. you were okay. <laughs> I, I was okay, right? I was an okay guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there, that's, there's a lot of research lessons in here for grad students if they're listening. So, <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about that piece, I, you know, in these... In the, during this period, we've already kind of touched on semiotics. You were using that to talk about some things. So this theory of language and this picture of language and such. You're also using concepts of structuring and structuration during this period and for what for going on. So what did you find helpful at that time? And we've already kind of touched on there wasn't a lot of like theory of technology and sociology, right? So nor in organization studies. Yeah. Um. So how did I stumble upon <laughs> structuration theory? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, or how, yeah, how did you find it? But also just what did you find useful about it to, like, to, for telling well, okay. these stories? So one of the big questions in sociology and by extension in organization studies is the link between micro actions Mm -hmm. Everyday everyday interactions between people and what people do all day long. And social structure. Mm -hmm. And when I first started to write up my dissertation, or at least the part of it that became this 86 paper, all I had to work with to make this link was um, Berger and Luckman's book, um, The um, Social... Social construction of reality, right? Exactly. The social construction of reality. And in there they use, they talk about a concept called sedimentation. Okay. Which is how, their, their story of about how institutions become institutions over time. And so I was telling the story about what was... Uh, you know where you're at, bud. You go ahead. <laughs> okay. So I had been telling the story of what was going on in the, with the CT scanners using sedimentation as a concept. Mm -hmm. And by chance, a lot of things have happened in my life or my career by chance. By chance, I picked up um, Giddens' books and started to read them. And, um, the whole notion that, you know, Giddens is really about how do you link micro and macro, right? Right. And this whole notion of structuration, I thought it was better developed conceptually than uh, sedimentation, although you can argue there. Better developed for what I needed. Uh -huh. um, and so I started to think about this whole thing through the framework of structuration. And... That allowed, you know, I knew what had happened. That allowed me to frame it up front 
Yeah. So, so to have an acceptable theoretical story to tell the organization studies community, particularly the audience of ASQ, who want a theoretical story, right? I would have right. been just happy to explain what was going on. Oh, and, fascinating. You know, uh, and I could have done that. <clears throat> but nobody really wants to publish straight ethnographic empiricism. <laughs> Is that that's really interesting so, point though? So yeah. you kind of have to dress it up. <laughs> I mean, would you like to publish pieces that are lean that way? Is that kind of your passion? Is the well, I the, wouldn't call it my. If it was my passion, I'd be doing more of it. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what you do when you write papers, but when I write papers, um, before I start writing, I've got to know what my data story. This is yeah, MIT, MIT training is all about if the data let the data speak to you is what the MIT okay is, right. So I let the data speak, and now I got the data story, and now how am I going to frame the data story? And then when I start writing, once I've got the, the frame, then I just write from front to back. Yeah, but until I, it's always the theoretical frame is never. I never start with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I always. It always comes at the end. Fascinating. And interestingly enough, for most ethnographers, that's true. Yeah. And I suspect, you, know, you can tell me whether this is true or not, but I suspect that's also true for historians to the degree that the historian has to have a theoretical story. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about areas where it's more theory driven. I think that's true in like political psychology. I have friends who tell me it's very theory driven, uh, econ probably. But yeah, that's interesting. So when this piece comes out, I mean, as I said, it's been cited 5,000 times. I mean, was it obvious right away that it was a hit? I mean, was it, were you getting lots of feedback um, from it immediately? Well, yeah, people would talk about it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like my phone was ringing off the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And you got to remember, in, in the mid-'80s, Google didn't exist. Google Scholar right. didn't exist. So, you know, it, to find out how often papers were being cited was really – you had to go to trouble. And, frankly, I never went to the trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, I went I – I didn't know anything about my citation counts at all until – Google Scholar came out and people started talking about it. That, and, that's funny. <laughs> you know, I could have, you know, up at that point in time, and that's still true today, I, I, I could care less about my citation counts. Sure. Yeah. Was, did you find a community of folks, other folks looking at technology pretty quickly? Or, I mean, how, did it feel like you were kind of on your own? Or, yeah, what was it like? Well, um, my final year at MIT, there was – I started hanging out with the STS people. Okay. And the STS people at that time, I'm trying to remember who everybody was who was there. Um, like Grant, Noble and Winter were already gone, right? Yeah, and they weren't important to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Good. I read them, right? I read them, right? But I, re but I didn't know them. Yeah, right? yeah, I yeah. Knew the guys that I'm talking about are guys like Frank Dubinskis, who was an anthropologist okay. of technology, who's, who's passed away actually fairly shortly after I graduated. Huh. Um, in this group was also uh, Laura Nader, okay, who was an anthropologist, Ralph Nader's sister, um, Sherry Turkle. <laughs> uh huh. Right. Um, I can't remember whether Shoshana Zuboff came or not. Mm -hmm. to this, but I met her at roughly the same time. There was one of Garfinkel students who had studied mathematicians by the name of Eric Livingston. I don't know whether you've ever come across any mm -mm. of this stuff. Um, but he did ethnometh, um, ethnomethodological studies of mathematicians and then became a mathematician. Fascinating. Um, and then, um, God, who else was there? Oh, Steve Woolgar. <laughs> oh, okay. Right? So. There was this incredible number of, for that particular year, incredible number of students of technology and science who had assembled at MIT 
many on sabbaticals or drawn from other schools or other places in, um, in Boston. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the MIT people were Leon Trilling, who was kind of a historian of, um, he was actually an engineer, but he was also did historic. He was an astro aero guy who did historical studies of astro aero. <laughs> mm -hmm. And some other guys, right? But there were all these people who had come to MIT for, well, only there for a year or so. Um, and I was really lucky I got exposed to these people. And so some of these people became uh, my immediate community of people who were studying technology. Um, I remember going over and talking to Shoshana, um, who had just started teaching at, at, at Harvard Business School. And you know, mm -hmm. she had she was about to come out with um um oh god I'm gonna space the name. Yeah, that early book is really interesting. It's great. Oh god. I know, man. In the age Dude. of the smart machine. Yeah, that's it. In the age of the smart machine. And yeah. so she and I talked and um so I had always thought of her as sign in my invisible college. She had, and then Vonda Orlikowski came to MIT. And Vonda came from, uh, she came there about the time I was leaving, but she had been writing about structuration and technology too. Okay. So over the years, I would say that Vonda and I have um, always been active members of our own little yeah. invisible college, as Diana Crane would have called <laughs> Yeah, and were were there any like were there any conferences you all were hanging out at together? Or was it more was it looser than that? Much looser. Much okay. Looser than that. Yeah. Um, it was really a lot looser. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I wondered is, you know, it's in the late eighties that uh, you know, uh, Solo publishes that thing that becomes the Solo paradox in that book review. You know, like you see computers. Uh, everywhere, but in the productivity there's, statistics or whatever. No, productivity, yeah. There's no productivity yeah. increase, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like economists are talking about like that, and there's also people in business schools into the early '90s that are like Bryn Yolfson are working yep. on that. Was, yeah, was that exactly was right. like was that like in, was that around you? Was that was that a concern people around you were talking about at the time? Well, I knew about all this stuff. Yeah, I certainly knew Bryn Yolfson's work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I read Solo. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about this offline. Let's, let's say I didn't have, save I didn't that have, one for later. I didn't have great love for MIT economists, except for oh Michael yeah, Moore. <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> yeah, um, but at any rate, I didn't read Solo, but I did read Eric's stuff on this. Mm -hmm. And then there were other papers written by economists that I can't remember who wrote this one, but he sort of discovered that people who used computers made more money than people who did it. And then some other guy wrote a pa some other guys wrote a paper and, and basically showed empirically that people who used pencils also made more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real economic debate for you right there. That's beautiful. right, right. So you know what it, what it really happened was it was a spurious they were spuriously measuring white collar work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but at any rate, um, God, I w that was not part of the debate. I was yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you got to remember, I did not go into a business. I've never taught in a business. I only got my degree from one. Mm -hmm. So I went directly from MIT into the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Yeah. Well, that's and, where I was headed next. And so, my interests yeah. had, were always more focused on work and, and labor than it was on, you know, how to make organizations productive, effective, and profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's actually, that's where I wanted to go. So from 84 to 94, you're at Cornell. And, uh, you know, who were, who were you, were, did you have close collaborators there? And were there any collaborative projects you were working on that structured things there for you? Well, um, what happened at Cornell, the short answer is I had colleagues, but what they weren't writing with, about technology. Mm -hmm. I was writing other kinds of things. 
So I wrote a paper with Pam Polvo, who came to Cornell the year before me, that laid out structuration theory much more explicitly with mm -hmm. respect to institutionalization. And um, I did a paper with Bob Stern, who was my close colleague in the ILR school, and we were writing about essentially um, the need for organization studies to study uh, the role of organizations in society, right? Right. Uh, and so I wrote, so my whole, if you look at my Vita, as I'm sure I know you have, right? Yeah. It's not like one technology paper after another technology no. paper. There's, there are, there's some clusters of things that I were interested in. But what happened at, I guess the closest thing that happened at Cornell to technology studies was in about 1990, um, a labor economist by the name of John Bishop, who studied education and labor, came to me and said the, the Department of Education is, has set up um, a national center for the education of the workforce at um, Pennsylvania University, University of Pennsylvania, out of the ed school there, and it's a co-op, and it's being um, the co-directors are one guy is from the ed school, and the other guy's is from the business school. Peter Capelli was a labor guy uh, that still is a labor guy at Wharton. And they want to fund research and can you write anything you want to have funded that would be, you know, we could talk about under the education of work. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And he got three days to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I said, oh, hell, why not? Right. So I sat down and, and I wrote this fantasy, <laughs> this fantasy proposal where I basically said, well, you know, what we're going to do here is we're going to, we don't know much about technicians work. We don't know the role that technicians play oh. in engineering and in science, right? Or anywhere else, right? Yeah. So let's do a bunch of comparative ethnographies <laughs> of, of technicians' occupations. They gave me the money. <laughs> It's amazing. I was going to ask you about those technicians' papers. And, and yeah. so I've got so now I've got this hunk of money <laughs> <laughs> and this commitment to study occupations, right? <laughs> and, uh, how the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> so I decide I'm going to run a seminar on um, on field methods, and to take this seminar, what people have to do is they have to choose to study. A technician's occupation, and huh. go out and do field work um, with medical techs, computer techs, um, engineering technicians, yeah, uh, EMTs, so on and so forth, right? And so this group of students do this stuff for a semester with me. At the end of the semester, I say, "Okay, I've got all this money." <laughs> I'll pay you as an RA if you want to continue to do the research on your occupation. And we'll all create this uh, research group where what we're doing is studying technicians. Amazing. And the people who joined, and this included Beth Beschke, who was an undergraduate at the time, as well as... Um, as well as Mario Scarsoletta, who didn't go into academia, Asaf Dar, who teaches in Haifa, Haifa um, Bonnie Nelson, uh, who I wrote a couple of papers with, uh, Stasia Zabuski, who was a postdoc anthropologist who joined the project, she wasn't part of this, but she joined the project after we got, after this course was over. And she had been studying uh, scientists in the European Space Agency. Hmm. And she and I did the research on computer technicians. And so we had this group. And yeah. for like two and a half years, we met. And uh, we did these ethnographies. And then we sort of did comparative analysis across all these ethnographies to come up with models, kind of ideal models of what technicians work are like, right? That uh, will allow you to talk about the way in which technicians fit into divisions of labor or production systems mm -hmm. uh, without uh, that that 
was broader, or a descriptive of multiple occupations. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm and we got a bunch of papers on that. No, man, that stuff's great. And, you know, and when we, yeah, when we were, when we were um, starting the maintainers group up, that was, uh, you know, when we were looking back and trying to find antecedents, people working on this, but that, that work often came up. It's, so it's, it's really good work. And um, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, first is you kind of briefly mentioned it, but you and I have talked about it in other contexts is how you ended up at this school of labor relations and how that kind of shaped your your interests or what you were working on a bit. I mean, so to one way of getting at it is, uh, you know, you have this uh, ASQ piece, technicians in the workplace, and it's like ethnographic evidence for bringing work into organizational studies. I think you have another paper around 2000 or something that's like bringing work back in. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a you had some kind of perception that work was not in the picture of organizational studies. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, OK, so you got to have a you got to see how organization studies have developed. To see why. Yeah, let's see I'm that. Interested. So if you go back to the to the 50s, uh, you get books like um, Alvin Goldner's Industrial Bureaucracy or um, Peter Blau, who actually became quite quantitative. But he wrote his first book was an ethnography called The Dynamics of Bureaucracy, and he studied two uh, two white-collar organizations, or Melville Dalt, Men Who Manage, who uh, went into organizations. Who, well, his, was, his is interesting because it's a covert ethnography. He, never, he, he became a manager of his company and never told him about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That wouldn't get through IRB anymore. I don't no, think. it wouldn't. It wouldn't. That's exactly right, right? Or, uh, or you get um, Don Roy stuff. Fact, yep. Right. And actually, one of the first books on computers was a field research project at Detroit Edison. Um, but there was all this field work. Yeah. And these guys were. Eli Shinoy's uh, the automobile worker in the American Dream, and these were these were focused on work that people did. Not they weren't like about the environment. Mm-hmm. They were about internal studies of, of work and work processes and how you would organize or coordinate work. Then around 1967, uh, there's a sea change in. Um, in organization studies. And this is the year that um, Lawrence and Warsh published their famous book. It was the year that Thompson publishes Organizations in Action. Uh, this is a year that um, Miller, who was with the Tavistock Institute in London, uh, the Tavistock guys have been studying work too. I mean, one of the best papers on work ever was. Um, Tristan Bamforth's paper of uh, mining operations mm-hmm. in England, right? When yeah. it shifts from being hand got methods to, to automated methods. Man, that paper is so good. It's all about work practices and processes. Well, not all about it, but that's the core of where they, mm-hmm. um, the empirical work, right? So, but in 67, what happens is all these theories start coming out and studies start coming out that say, look, you know, or, organizations are really shaped by their environment. Huh. And from that point forward, organization theory goes in two directions simultaneously. One, it becomes increasingly quantitative because computers are also now becoming available right. and for analysis of large data sets. And it becomes increasingly focused on environmental analysis and how environments shape organization systems and structures. So if you look at all the major organizational theories since the late 60s, which would include what was called contingency theory in the books that I mentioned, and then to population ecology and to institutional theory and to resource dependency theory, all of these theories are really theories about how organizations operate in a larger environment and provide certain kinds of resources or not, right? Yeah. Either symbolic as in the, and, and, and uh, 
social in the case of institutional theory or literally hardcore resources or um, <laughs> yeah you know or ecolog you know bringing ecological analysis into organizations to talk about organizations as species and so on and so forth. yeah yeah, yeah. and that one's highly mathematical right mm -hmm. um so here I am in 1983, looking around and going, stuff I really love is not being done anymore. Yeah. Going on. The world, I got here 16 years too late or whatever. Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> you know, I should have been born in the 30s, right? Yeah. Probably been shot somewhere on, you know, on right. D-Day and never been. <laughs> At any rate, right. Um, I go, so I started, I was studying work, right? Yeah. And that's what I started off doing. That's what I liked, right? And I looked around and said, well, look, you know, work is changing. This is what computers are doing, right? Yeah. Service industries are becoming more important. Uh, by 1994 with, with NAFTA, you know, factory work is becoming far less common, as everybody should know today, right? Yeah. And we better start figuring out what work is like because you're not going to be able to write about organizations unless you have some sense of what it is they're organizing. Right, right, right. <laughs> And so yeah. I started writing about – I went to the ILR school in part because I never wanted to teach MBAs and because I could study work there. And I was sympathetic with workers. Mm -hmm. And so I've been studying – you know, I guess if you were to say what do I really do, what – ties together the various streams of my research. It's interesting work and the role that work plays in people's lives. Yeah. That's right. And so another question I wanted to ask you about the technician stuff. I mean you point you said earlier when you're telling the story of how you got into it, we didn't have a lot of stuff on technicians yet. But was there also a sense that you had at the time that this was like an expanding uh category of jobs? Yes. Yes, uh, most definitely. And there's been really very little work done on technicians since this project that, yeah. that we did. I uh, have a Daniel Bovenberg who just graduated from from UCSB. Uh, I was her chair. She did. She's done an ethnography of of the staff in Nano technology facilities. Yep. Uh, they would not use they don't use the word technicians to describe themselves and they would probably be uh, put off. Yeah, by yeah. The use of the word, right? But I don't use the word. I'm not using the word technician in the way that people in a lab would use the word technician. I'm using it in the way that this group of people that I work with kind of conceptualize this as an ideal type of occupation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um in that sense, she was studying technical technicians. Yeah. Amy Slayton, I don't know if you've ever bumped into her. She's working oh, on it, too. She's at Drexel. Uh, um, yeah, I should connect you two eventually. Yeah, um, someday you should send me her name in an email. Sometime. Will do. Uh, yeah, it's into, one of the reasons I was interested in it is because, uh, you know, I, I've continued working on this stuff on Robert Reich that I gave it, you know, gave a talk about. Um, and I'm, now I'm writing about this law that Clinton and Rice tried to pass in 1994 that was called the Reemployment Act. And it was all about responding to the new economy and shifting things. But Reich is really talking about technicians like all the time. You really thought it was like the great hope of America. The future of America was this the technician category. So it's just it's remind me to tell you my story about Reich. OK, <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um. So let me see. There's a couple different places I want to go. Oh, well, we, before I uh, let's see the timing here. OK, uh, another th kind of hub. So you have these hubs, as you mentioned, these kind of hubs of interest that have gone through your career. One of the other ones that I've I see is, you know, you have this piece with Kunda, is it? It's called yeah, Design yeah. and Devotion, yep. Surges of Rational and Normative Ideologies of Control and Managerial right. Discourse. And I see this is a thread that kind of goes through your career. I mean, in some ways, it goes right up to that paper you've written with Bob Eberhardt and Andrew Nelson on ideologies of entrepreneurship yep. and stuff right. like that. So how did how did that piece come to be? And you know, how what were you up to there? To yeah. Well, all right. So I've already told you somewhere that what was happening when I was in graduate school, and Gideon was my office mate, 
uh, at MIT was the emergence of interest in organizational culture. Mm -hmm. But the way we understood that at MIT at the time was that we we were adopting the perspective. We were treating organizations like anthropologists would treat a society. And for us, uh, cultures weren't things to be manipulated, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. They weren't to be used for control. That that cultures are what make kind of organizations unique and different from each other, just like the cultures of national societies or groups of people, right? Mm-hmm. Make them different from others, right? Well, what had happened very shortly after this, this was a, this, this interest in culture was centered at MIT and at Stanford, uh, around Joanne Martin at Stanford. And there were some other people, uh, but those were the two clusters. And, um, very shortly thereafter, this starts at MIT and Stanford, Peters and Waterman write this book called I don't remember what it was called. It doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, you can always look at Peter's <laughs> and Waterman, right? Okay. Um, but what starts to happen is this concept starts to flow out into the world of management. Yeah. And these guys are talking about how to manipulate culture. Yeah. And to manipulate it in a way that will uh, increase the performance of the organization. Yeah. So Gideon and I are pissed off. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, you know, we decide we're going to study the whole concept of culture and, you know, fit it into kind of an ideological framework. And we're going to do it. Ethno- we're going to do it quantitatively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as best we can. Right. So qualitatively and quantitatively. And we come up with this analysis. We, so we start doing history, too. And history of managerial thought. And it becomes fairly clear that if you look over from basically the era of, say, 1850s on, or even a little earlier than that, over time, what you see are these management rhetorics, ideologies. Some of them emerge, and they're highly rational, like scientific management, Mm -hmm. and they're shooting for efficiency. And they're also focused on machining, machines, right? Um, capital. And then you come in these other periods of time where the managerial theories are really about people and, you know, how to, how to make them, how to make them more loyal or, you know, produce yeah, yeah, more. Yeah. And, and so, so, so the focus is on labor, right? So you have labor and you have capital, right? The two mm-hmm. the two main variables in, in, in labor economics and productivity theory and blah, 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 right? Right. So we start plotting this stuff through time and we can't quite figure out why it's happening, right? No, wait a minute. I'm talking design and devotion. Yes, that's right. That's what you asked me about, right? Yeah. 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 Not cultures of culture. Design and devotion. So uh, we come up, we discover, right, that these things start happening along about the time that guys are writing about long waves in the economy. Uh, they seem to be happening at about the same time. So anyway, that's how that paper came about. We didn't know how to frame the paper until we until we discovered long wave theory. <laughs> huh. So it's kind of like discovering yeah yeah structuration theory <laughs> after it was done, right? Right, right, right. But we knew we knew it happened, but we couldn't like. Couldn't yeah. just tell an empirical story, right? It had, it had to be like a theoretical story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other thing that happens, well, you had a lot going on all at once. Uh, in '93, you become an editor at ASQ, right? And I mean, that seems like it must have been a huge shift for you professionally. I mean, like just in terms of what you're wor- like, that must have been like that's a huge job, right? That must have been it all was you a were doing. Good job. It was no, yeah. it wasn't all I was. No. Doing. Um, I would manage to write some papers too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a big job. Um, 
At that point in time, the editor of ASQ had to be on the faculty of Cornell. Okay. Because Cornell owns the journal. Okay. And um, there was, at that point in time, John Freeman, who had come to MIT to be the editor, uh, come, excuse me, come to Cornell to be the editor of ASQ, was leaving. And they really didn't have anybody else in the business school who could be a viable editor. So I had been the book review editor for ASQ prior to becoming editor. And so the editorship came to me because I wasn't in the business school, but I was at Cornell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I became the editor. Then a year or so later, I moved to California. And um, I spent part of the next couple of years um, negotiating with this guy who was an interim dean, really great guy, Tom Dykeman. And I convinced him that journal was really uh, belonged to the field. Yeah. And that it was unreasonable. It would be a detriment to the field if, if Cornell continued to use this as primarily as a tool of recruiting season faculty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because they couldn't guarantee that the right person who would, for the journal would be the person who'd want to come to Cornell, which we all know is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it is gorgeous. <laughs> right? Um, right. Um, and, you know, Tom agreed. Yeah. Tom said, okay, all we need to have are some procedures here and some escape clauses of things don't work out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but we managed to, you know, we managed to transfer the editorship to using a process for selecting an editor uh, that didn't require that the editor be on the faculty. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things I did did playing that role, do you think it shifted? Were there any shifts that came kind of intellectually for you out of that? I mean, I imagine you're like seeing everything from such a high level when you're in that kind of role, you know? You're seeing all the kind of stuff coming out in the field and... I don't think it had much of an impact on my on my intellectual interests or the yeah. kinds of things I want to do research. Um, I saw... The job of being—I saw being an editor as a job. Mm-hmm. Um, I was running an organization, yeah, and I was doing it for the betterment of the field, or for for I was doing it for my discipline, right? Yeah. And the one thing I couldn't do was impose my views of what the field should be doing onto the journal. Um. Nor could I allow any other people's idea of what the, the field should be to dominate the journal. And my job was to provide um, an outlet for the range of research that was going on in the field. Yeah, and it was that's what I had to protect. I had to make sure the qual had to ensure the quality of what was being published. But I couldn't do any. I, but there was no way that I could shape the content. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now I don't know whether all editors do this or not. But yeah, well, that's, that's the idea, notion. right? That's my yeah. notion of what the job's about. Yeah, right. So in the in the mid '90s, you you moved to Stanford. And, you know, Stanford's come up in the our conversation already a couple times. So it's a mm-hmm. hub of people working mm-hmm. on organizations and technology uh you know what drew you there and uh you know what you you know what was your what was the scene like when you were when you arrived well what drew me there was there were some things going on in cornell where i wanted to escape and there were some people in stanford that i liked a lot (laughs) you know uh, and it was california yeah right um you know i would have gone to berkeley in 1970 if I had had to go to school. Uh, interestingly enough, the reason I didn't think much about it because I couldn't afford the airfare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, William Mary was a state school and, you know, the, tu- and the tuition was much less, right? Although right, California, right. would, I would have been there a year and then I would pay, at that time, pay next to nothing. 
Yeah. It's a good thing I didn't go to Berkeley in 1970. I may not have been able to keep it together long enough to become an academic. I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would have been just too easy to go to a Grateful Dead concert every right. day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at any rate, I, I, I went to Stanford and um, I was excited about this because you know, here I am, a guy who studies technical people and studies technical work and studies technology and its impact on other people's work. I'm particularly interested in computational technologies. Right. And this is like ground zero. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, by that time, I had begun to work with people at Xerox Park. Um, I never, well, I wrote with Julian Orr, who was at Xerox Park. Mm -hmm. um, but Lucy Suchman was there. Um, Jeanette Blomberg was there. John Seeley Brown, who ran Park at that time, was really interested in the kinds of things that we were doing and saw value in ethnography. Right. And so part of what drew me there was not just the people at Stanford, but the people at Park. Mm -hmm. So I could be in, for several years, I was up at Park every two weeks hmm. or so, right? Just hanging mm -hmm. out with those guys. Wow. So it was like going to what I thought was Mecca. Now, I don't I wouldn't say the Silicon Valley is much of a Mecca today. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But in the early 90s and late 80s and early 90s it was. Mhm. Mm and one of the things you do at Stanford is you you start this center, right? On mm -hmm. So tell tell us what was its name and tell us about how that it came to be. It's called the Center for Work Technology and Organization. And okay, so how does it come to be? Um, so I had been hired to come out, and under the what the dean told me, the dean of the business school, or excuse me, the engineering school at the time, told me he wanted to do was establish a program on technology to work. Mm -hmm. But I got there, and there really were no resources to do it with. Mm -hmm. um, one person isn't going to isn't going to really create a center, <laughs> right? Yeah, you need. You a lot of people try that, by the way, in academia, yeah, know, but it doesn't work very well. But it doesn't work. Right? You, need, <laughs> you need some kind of critical mass. Yeah. And the critical mass might be two or three people. It doesn't have to be like yeah. 100 people, right? But it's hard to do on one person. So I got a job offer from MIT. They wanted to hire ah. me to come back. They wanted to hire me to come back to become the head of what was then the Behavioral Policy Sciences Group, which included the group that I graduated. And it went back, and for a variety of reasons I don't want to talk about, uh, I decided that I really didn't want to go to MIT. Mm -hmm. But I thought, okay, I can use this. <laughs> <laughs> so I went mm -hmm. back and I told the dean, I said, you know, I've got a job offer from MIT. And uh, if you want to keep me here, here's what we got to do. Right? You've got to give me enough funding for me to, to start a center for study of technology work in organizations. And he said, okay, write me a proposal. So I wrote him a proposal that included multiple faculty lines. I think I asked for three, but I got two. That's pretty that good. Amazing, right? Yeah, that's um, great. They gave me um, some scholarships to recruit PhD students. That they, the scholarships didn't last through time; they were like one-shot deals. But still, yeah. right? You know, I, there was enough money to recruit some initial students, and a quarter of a million dollars started. And so I said, and I said, I, you know, you don't have to give me any money. I don't really care about. It. You, know, you have to increase my salary, which I think is why they did this, right? Hmm. They, they, you know, if you, I've been around academia long enough to know that people get offers from other schools almost 99% of the time to increase their own salaries. Right, right, right. right. And I didn't ask for that. I just, I said, don't pay me more. Put your money here. Put your money, put your money where your mouth was when you recruited. Uh huh. And I think. I think the dean liked that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. So who do you who are the two lines that 
Who who did uh the people we ultimately hired were Pam um Hines mm-hmm. and Diane Bailey. Okay. And did you know Diane Diane was she a student of yours or no? I didn't know either one of them. Okay. Uh, until we hired them. So they came out to do job talks. I didn't know either one of them. Interesting. Wow. And what was, was there, were there like first projects under the rubric of this new center? Was there like first projects you tackled or what? Did well, you think, there were, yeah. I mean, this project that Gideon, Gideon came out and did a couple of, the, the Israelis get, you know, they, they don't pay the Israelis anything, but they give them lots of money to go somewhere and hang out for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So Gideon came out a couple times and became stayed there, um, stayed at WTO. And so what happened was Diane starts this huge project on engineers' work. Yeah, and she's studying. She starts off studying structural engineers and ship designs. Yep, and then somehow. What happens is General Motors comes to us and says, we would like you guys to help us work. We'd like to build a lab with you guys. And we're interested in um, uh, engineering work and making it more effective and efficient. And I said, well, you know, there's some things I can do, but I can't do that, all of that. So you need to, you should really talk to the department as a whole and not just WTO and let WTO be a part of what you find. So lo and behold, that happens. Wow. And, you know, so now we're talking more than a million dollars a year in research funds coming in annually from General Motors. Wow. And that then allows us to get NSF grants, right? Because General Motors is pumping down money and, you know, NSF in the 80s became really interested, started to get really interested in helping industry and partnering with industry. So we get more money from NSF now to do these huge studies of, of um, engineers and, um, and uh, finite element analysis and other technologies in General Motors. Hmm. I probably shouldn't have said that, but that's okay. <laughs> I really loved working with General Motors. Those guys were yeah. And and that lasted until um 2008 when Columbia crashed. Right. And GM went bankrupt. And a lot of the guys that I were working with got laid off. Mhm. These were guys primarily Jesus. from the R&D world. Right? Okay. But for this you know, for this 10-year period from about 96 to about 2008, right? Mhm. There are these huge projects studying engineers and then there was another project that Gideon and I did studying contract workers. Right. And, 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 and Pam Hyens was doing a series of studies on people's interactions with robots. Yep. So for this 10-year this period, was we had so much money. Yeah, yeah. You know. By computer science standards, it wasn't much money. But by social science standards, it was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. we were getting to do stuff that was totally online with what we set the damn center up to do. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it reminds me of that if the, the story of your technician stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just so much social science it really takes teams but getting together large-scale teams is just you know you read about like Bordeaux, like what he was up to in france and how many soldiers he had and it was just like well that's how you make these amazing studies happen but you know it just it doesn't happen very often that those stars align in that way no you need money yeah <laughs> <laughs> you don't have money it's not right, gonna happen. right <laughs> right and that's even before you get the people, right? Then right. you have to worry about whether you can find the people. But I can guarantee you won't find the people without the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, so for instance, um, well, I want to talk to you about your um, consulting, the consultant's book. But, like, Paul Leonardi's Car Crashes Without Cars, is that, that one that. study that came comes out, out of that? Yeah, a whole bunch of Paul stuff comes out yeah. of the uh, uh, 
like his book with Bailey, yeah. the technology choices. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. That's an amazing story. Yeah. yeah. I didn't write as much. They wrote more out of this, this GM project that, that I did. I think I only got one paper, but this is because they did field work and I didn't do the field work. Then, right. And yeah, um, you were you were you were or you were managing this this center and uh, well, yeah, I was kind of, yeah I was managing the center with along with Bob Sutton who was the co-director okay um oh interesting and the projects at General Motors and was were really being managed by Diane I mean I had okay some, you know I helped her write we we wrote the grants together cool uh, at least as I recall we did yeah <laughs> um but. Um, that may not be true. <laughs> and uh kinda headed in Trump direction here. <laughs> Except in my case I just can't remember. In his case I think he just actively lies. <laughs> uh but it but um yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was managing the center. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, so I like that. I also love the gurus hired guns and warm bodies, like this this consultants thing, and that came that came out of the center's work, is what I hear you saying. At least partly, it was aligned with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first off, I wouldn't call them consultants. They sometimes use that term themselves, but you know, I think the accurate word is contractors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what these are guys who this was a big deal in the early nineties, right? It was still a big deal today. I mean, this is what gig work on. Right. Uh, but in the 90s, right, there was this whole, and I, I write about this in this paper that I did with Eberhardt, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, this was a period of time where there was a fascination with outsourcing work to people who were not your real employees, who you could hire for a shorter period of time. And there was a fascination with jettisoning employment in an organization yeah to become a freelancer uh, where you could free yourself right yeah from yeah, yeah. the constraints of organization you know what what a load of shit right but right. at any rate free yourself right and um so gideon and i decide you know this is like this is this is really interesting because Historically, these contractors, contract employment relationships were called temporary employment. And it was primarily clerical workers and light industrial workers, mm-hmm. some, some, some nurses, temporary nurses, right? But it wasn't white collar work. It wasn't engineers. Uh, you know, even at that period of time, there were organizations founded to provide contract CEOs to firms. Mm-hmm. And so Gideon and I having this labor interest, you know, this is this is really different. This is a very different kind of employment situation system that uh, then you know was put into place around the New Deal, and looks more like what was going on in the 1880s than what was going on in the 1950s and 60s. Right? Yeah. So we got lucky again, and we. There was a conference at, there was another organization at Stanford, and we went to a, to a talk, series of talks, and we met a woman who ran a staffing agency. And we said, well, here's our opportunity. So we went to her and said, well, can we study what you guys are doing? And she said, yes. And that just opened up this whole oh, ecosystem. Wow. Us, right? Yeah, right. From, <laughs> from the industry association to other uh, staffing agencies to firms that were hiring to the contractors that we wow. did life histories with it just opened everything up for us wow so for two years we did field work huh yeah and we did not only have not not only life histories with contractors about you know what why did they leave what did they do what what was their lives like you know kind of not, not unlike what we're doing right now <laughs> and then we did we did ethnographies of three staffing agencies and we did shorter um, field work. Well, I would call them interview, I guess, interview visits to firms that were hi- and man- with managers that were hiring contractors, high end software developers and engineers. So it allowed us to have to talk about 
contract employment from the perspective of all the three major groups of actors. That are wow. In the labor market. That's amazing, man. <laughs> so uh, I just want to, I'm going to, you're about that time that book comes out. I'm just going to ask you about a random paper. I, well, no, I need to go back for a second. You also have this 2001 article with Orlikowski. Oh, <laughs> yes. We yeah. Did. The technology and institutions, what can research on information technology and research on organizations learn from each other? And I you know for this is another one. This is a kind of for me, like a major touchstone piece. And I think it really was a kind of summary of all these kind of different threads coming together. Um, you know, it's been cited a lot. So, I mean, like, what what did you how did you see what was the move in that piece? Like, what did what were you trying to accomplish with with Vonda at that uh. point? Well, I've already told you that Vonda and I were, we're probably, our heads are probably, except for the people I've trained, right? Our heads are probably closer together in this topic than yeah. anyone else you can think of. Right? And so we had had a series of conversations and we thought that if you're going to be studying technology and its use in organizations, you needed to be able to not only know something about the technologies like the like the information systems people right but you needed to know a lot about organizations and you needed to embed all this stuff what you're writing about you needed to see its relationships to the emergence of new institutions and the existing and and, and the, the, uh, the social forces that created by existing institutions and so we wrote that paper with the intent of trying to get organization studies and information technology, information systems people to collaborate more with each other. Got to it. Build on each other's work. Mm -hmm. And we published that in, uh, in uh, the MISQ. Interesting enough, last year, the editor of ASQ and the editor of MISQ came to both Vonda and I and asked us to do a new collection of papers, uh, to do a collection of papers published either in ASQ or in MISQ that kind of took what we said uh -huh, oh, that's cool. and, and tried to do what we did. So that that's actually coming out. It's not going to come out in print. It's going to come out online. Uh, and it's going it, it, to be announced. Well, actually, it's already been announced. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to do a... Uh, uh, like a Zoom seminar, a Zoom. Oh, a webinar, okay. A webinar, a webinar. Right? When is that? When is the webinar? Oh, oh shit! I don't know. Sometime this fall, or yeah, sometime in September. Which, okay. Uh, I'll get a. I'll drop you an email. I want to. Yeah, if I can yeah. be there, I want to be there yeah, for that. That sure. sounds awesome. And yeah. so the authors of all these ten papers that we picked are going to be part of this too. That's cool. I think does Matt Bean have a? Is he in the mix? Matt I can't Bean remember. is yeah. one of them. Yeah, Natalia Lavinia has a paper there. Cool. Um, uh, Churchill and Patriota have a paper there. Um, there's a bunch of people. Beth Beschke has a paper there on DNA uh, cool. analysis. Uh, Beth did a great ethnography of uh, of a forensic science labs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, wow. You know her. The, the, she wrote, she just recently, pub, like two years ago, published a book on this. I, <laughs> uh, but it's great. It's like, for those of people who, who are like involved with Bones or involved with CS, you know, yeah, CSI, yeah. right? They should read her book because life ain't like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay, so now I'm just going to, there are, I mean, we passed over in so many papers that you you, you wrote, um, many of which are fun and interesting and great. I just wanted to ask you, you have this paper with two co-authors, email as a source of and symbol of stress. So, I mean, I, I found that, I remember finding that when I, was, when I was preparing notes to talk to you, like on a day that I was very stressed out by email because my inbox is totally <laughs> kicking my ass. So like, <laughs> I imagine that just came out of like life experience. Is that where that piece came from? Um, there was, I have a long history with, uh, stress studies that, um, never happened, right? Ah. Uh, there was original paper back in the early 90s that it fitted ROB about stress, um, 
I, I wrote it with uh, a woman named Debbie Knight. And this was going to be the topic of her dissertation, but then she left academia. But we had collected network data on three hospitals and every person in those every every employee in those hospitals. Huh. And the underlying notion was that some occupations use stress and talk about stress as a way of complaining. Yeah. And organizing, right? Mm-hmm. And complaining about their work. And so we did these studies, it never got published. Part because there was too much subject attrition. Beth and I tried to take the data about ten years later and turn it into a paper because it was based primarily on using network analysis and survey data. We lost. We didn't have network analysts would really like you to have like you know, sixty or higher response rate. Right. Response rate. And we had like 30, mm-hmm. which, you know, so people kept saying, well, we don't really know, be, you know, we can't publish this paper because it was too much missing data. And uh, so I, we just decided that's it, screw it, you know. There's no way we can, we can't, there are a lot of things you can do to help you reanalyze data, but one of the things you can't do unless you've got a lot of money is go back and re resample the same people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> it had been so long that probably half of them were no longer working for the organizations and some percentage of them had probably passed away. So Right, right. So it never got published. But that was one thing, right? I was interested in the whole use of stress as a way of complaining. Uh, You're like performative among, stress, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Talking about stress is, among certain occupations is a way of like bitching. Right. right. Certainly true yeah. of academia, 100%. Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> so there was that yeah. that did it happen. Yeah. And then there was another study that never happened that I had designed with Gloria Mark, who's at the School of Informatics at Irvine. And our notion was that email is addictive. Mm. And how would we know, how could we, how could we prove that it was addictive? And we worked out this whole paradigm where we would measure stress in terms of physiological data. You know, we can basically have people wear something that would give us their galvanic skin response. And, so uh-huh. and then what we would do is we'd find an organization that would let us, for a period of time, uh, shut off the email. <laughs> You know, just for just for a few days, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> and other people would not have their email shut off, right? Oh, wow. And then, because we didn't figure we could measure addiction, we thought we could measure withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so, dark. So that's why, that's why we were going to like have people's galvanic. You know, we're going to yeah, measure yeah. their little physical anxiety yeah. in the period of time where. Their email's mounting up and they can't get to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, Gloria actually did talk the army into letting her do some stuff, but the sample was pretty small. But right. still, so there was a study that didn't come off. So you can see I'm still interested in this idea of stress. Huh? Yeah. So when Debbie Knight and I, I mean Debbie Knight, Deb Meyerson and I start talking about this stuff and we decide, well, you know, there's stress and email. And we, so we kind of combined it t- together, these things in the past and, that we, I've been thinking about. And we thought, well, okay, how do people respond to this addiction? How do they respond to the fact, how do they respond to the fact that they get the, their emails driving them crazy, right? Uh, what do they do, right? Uh, and so the simple part of this, uh, Email is a symbol. Of what a, what's the title again? <laughs> it's uh, I got it right here. It's email as a source and symbol of stress. Right. So the whole point of this study was to show that yes, indeed, email does call stress, but at the same time, right? Yeah. There is a symbolic aspect to email and answering email that people use to complain, right? Yeah. And that's what that paper's about. 
And it's that's actually it, there's interview data in it, but it's also quantitative data. Yeah. I mean, we gave them stress measures, and <laughs> you know, we we had them fill out logs. <laughs> Of communication for three days, and okay, I got a telephone call from this person that was about this, and how do I feel afterwards? And you know, all this kind of stuff about logs about their communication activities. <laughs> That's great, man. So, uh, at some point, you you moved to UCSB, which is where mm-hmm. you were. Yeah, in the late 2015. Okay. And what was the what was the attraction there? Paul Leonardi, he was a student of yours, right, or had That's been. Right. That's right. And there are other folks there. I mean, what 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 drew you there to Santa Barbara? Well, again, there's always reasons to leave a place and right. reasons to go to the place. I'm not going to talk about the reasons to leave a place, right? Uh, but I will talk about the reasons to go why I went there. And you know, so here I am in 2015. This is eight years ago, so I'm at that point in time 62. Mm-hmm. And um, Paul gets asked to come to um, the UCSB, they recruit him, to take what was a program and turn it into eventually a department, which happened two years ago. And what this involved was recruiting a bunch of faculty, research faculty. Uh, there had been teaching faculty in this program, but you know, there really wasn't a search going on, mm-hmm. technology studies. Um, to recruit people, build a master's program, and, and launch a PhD program. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about it was it was going to be in the engineering school. And UCSB does not have a business school. So, Paul was try, initially tried to recruit. Well, the first thing that happened was I got asked to write by the UC system to write a document about the viability of this program that they had proposed. And then Paul, they hire Paul, and he starts to recruit people. And uh, he, his initial, among the initial people he tried to hire were Andrew Nelson, who was my student, and Brian Pentland, uh, who was a peer of mine at MIT, and I value both of them greatly as scholars. And I said to him one day, I said, well, you know, if you mind up getting these guys, I'll come too. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one reason or another, neither Brian nor Andrew could go to UCSB. Mm-hmm. Right. And so he calls me up and he says, would you still be interested? And it happened at just the right time because of things that were going on at Stanford. And I said, sure, I'll come down, but you know, I don't want you to bill me as a, as a recruit. I just want to come down and give a talk, and I want to check things out. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. And I got there, and I was pretty impressed with the collegiality of the other people who were there. I was totally impressed by the fact that they let the staff in it for me. Right. Oh, that, uh, what that's a guy who's into work. That's good. You know, right? What organization would let <laughs> the admins, nice. the administrative people in the department actually interview and have input into wow. whether they would hire a faculty member? I thought, man, this is great. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> this is socialism yeah. in action. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so there was an opportunity to build this program, and I thought, okay, so what am I going to do with the next seven years of my life, right, before I retire? And I said, okay, let's go here. And we went down and we looked at the place, and Debbie really liked it, my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so it was easy to move here uh, because we also were thinking, well, this would be a good place to be when you retire. Yeah. And that's how I got here. And so for about, for about, you know, for seven years, I helped these guys build this department, launch a PhD, put it, put an MBA program, not an MBA, a master's program into, into effect, develop and launch and recruit a, a PhD program and then recruit students for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a good way. Yeah. It was a good thing to do at the end of my career. And were there, were there, I mean, do you, when you think of that, that time, were there, are there certain projects 
personal projects you work on? I mean, one of the things I want to, well, let me just ask you that question. Like during that period, were there any projects kind of fit that moment? When I, you know, once I came to UCSB. Yeah. Um, there was a project that we launched that never materialized. Uh, it resulted in some studies that Paul and a couple of graduate students wrote. I'll tell you what the project was. The project yeah. was uh, Paul had this idea that we should be, there are an entrepreneur, people who really make it, i.e., rich people. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Um, create their create an organization, often to run their lives. Right. And their families. Right. Right. And this includes babysitters, airplane pilots, yeah, people yeah, yeah. who sell them their homes, their gardeners, their personal assistants. You know, there's a, there's a yeah. whole organization, right? And we thought, you know, this has never been written about mm -hmm. the organizations that. Rich people build to manage their lives, right? Yep. And so we start off studying real estate agents, and we start off. Then we move to studying nannies, and we're getting real estate agents and nannies who deal with sort of regular people and the wealthy, right? And we do a we interview a pilot, and there's some other people that we interview, and then we realize, well, you know, we really can't pull this study together without having some rich people. <laughs> need to find a couple rich folks yeah exactly it, it turns out to be really freaking hard to get rich people to want to agree and we tried a whole bunch of ways to get entrepreneurs fascinating and, you know, i mean they'll talk to you about their work they're not going to talk to you about their home lives is that, exactly. is that the issue yeah well you know and we were presenting it like you know to be a successful entrepreneur and to continue to do this right mm-hmm it requires so much of your time that you have to have a way of out, offloading, I guess is the way to put it, yeah. some of the other duties that go so that you can also have a personal life <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? that isn't completely taken up by mowing the lawn. <laughs> right. Right. And well, we were never capable of doing that. Yeah, yeah. We I could never you. get those people. And yeah. so... I just said, you know, there's no point in going forward with this anymore uh, without some entrepreneurs who have built these kinds of organizations. Um, all we've got are ethnographies of nannies and right, ethnographies right. of real estate agents, right? And so yeah. you guys do with what you want uh, with that, and that's it. You know, there were a few other papers that um, I wrote during this period of time, mostly with PhD students. Um, a couple of others. I finished up a study of um, of how the internet had changed automobile sales, which is a project that I started huh. when we were, I was at Stanford. Yeah. Uh, finished up some papers with some of my my last PhD students at Stanford, uh, and I did a couple of other things, and then wrote this final paper with uh, Eberhardt and Andrew Nelson on entrepreneurship as an ideology. Yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to connect that to the, the thing you were talking about doing with Paul on kind of entrepreneurs and their private lives. Because when, when you, the first time you talked to me about that, I mean, okay, it's backing up. One of the things, I remember uh, I was in a discussion at Carnegie Mellon where I did my PhD with uh, Stephen Klepper, the economist mm -hmm. and some yeah. other folks yeah. there. And I remember someone said very memorably that most places in America have like a normal bell curve uh, when it comes to educational attainment. But the bell curve for educational attainment in Silicon Valley was like in an inverted bell curve, actually, because you have a lot of, you know, right. have a bunch of really highly educated people. And then you have a bunch of highly uneducated people who are like their nannies and their lawn people and like you know it's like a servant class basically for the rich folks and um you know and you know earlier you said like uh you know uh, silicon valley's not mecca anymore and uh you know and then you have this paper with bob uh bob well, Everhart. i didn't say it wasn't a mecca i just said it wasn't <laughs> what it was before yeah 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 well i mean yeah 
there's been a change. And, you know, and then I see kind of this critique of ideology, which, again, is something that's, you know, a thread through your career for sure. But it seems like it's kind of with your paper with Andrew and and Bob, uh, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. There's kind of like criticism of Silicon Valley culture in some of your projects that you're doing towards the end of your life after maybe, maybe not surprisingly after you left, or maybe they even started before then. But um, yeah, I mean, how did that develop? Was it just like your reaction to what you saw going on around you, you think? Or? Yeah, probably a little something. Yeah. When I first went to the Silicon Valley, well, here's the way I'd explain it. Right? There was this, there's this guy David Liddell, <laughs> who I knew when I when I first got there. He he had a, he ran a research institute, kind of like Park, but much smaller. And <laughs> Liddell once said to me, he said, "You know, the secret of running a high tech firm is you had to have just the right mix of hippies and nerds." <laughs> <laughs> and my, I think what happened to the Silicon Valley is the hippies all died. <laughs> <laughs> and all they were left with were nerds who had read and ran and were interested in making money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so the whole libertarian culture of yeah. Silicon Valley and guys who think, that because they had made a lot of money, they were in a position to really shape society and go even yeah. further to shape society with their technology, but to tell them how society should be run uh, got to me after a while. Uh, well, it took 22 yeah. years, but it kind of got to me. Um, and uh, so it was, I became disillusioned with. Uh, the broader culture in Silicon Valley. Um, it starts to really, it starts to really change when they stop making things and they start making apps, right? So, yeah. you know, what was it? The internet 2.0 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. The social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. When they were still making computers and building software that people could use to do tasks, it was yeah. a different place. That's you know, when I When yeah. I got there, when I got there, there were, Along 101, which runs down the, um, the west side of the bay, was loaded with machine shops. You know, building. Oh, fascinating, really? Yeah, building, you oh, know, wow. boxes for, and other kinds of metal components yeah. for, uh, for the stuff that was being produced by the computer manufacturers. Wow. And there still are a bunch yeah. of those. I have a, I have a friend, um, um, Chuck Dara. Who was the chair of Anthro at the at the uh, San Jose? Who is writing a book now on manufacture? He's he's a retired anthropologist, so he's writing it slowly. But he's writing a book about manufacturing and in in the Silicon Valley. And there's still people that are there doing machine shopping and this sort of stuff. But it isn't like it used to be. Yeah, uh, it was just the whole that whole area was just all machine shops. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other, you know, the last thing I wanted you to, to talk to you about is, um, you know, you have in 2020, you have uh, uh, your book, Work and Technological Change comes out. Right. And uh, I can't remember. I was just trying to look it up here. You also have uh, sometime around there. You, well, those probably, I think the book starts as your Oxford lectures. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so you give these lectures at Oxford, which you know I knew of your work before, but I really seriously watched those lectures, and I saw it as kind of like a <laughs> kind of career retrospective or something like. I mean, like you would you were you were trying to you would enter this moment where you're trying to like get down what you thought after all this time. Is that That's fair? Right. That's fair. That's totally fair. That's exactly what that book was. Yeah. Uh, how did it feel? I mean, like you know, what was the experience? Of, like I don't know. What did it feel like to do that? <laughs> What did it feel like to do yeah, that? Yeah, what did it feel like to do that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what a, what response is, I spent 40 years doing this and all I could get is 135 pages? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't a very long book, right? <laughs> no, it's not. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, right, it was 
an opportunity to pull things together. Yeah. And it was, you know, I don't know whether people who read this know, honestly, realize, although if they read the introduction, they'll know what I think I was up to when I did this, right? It was a way of bringing some kind of closure to those 40 years. Yeah. And a, a tacit admission to others, maybe, but an explicit, maybe kind of tacit to me initially, too, right? That I was done with this. <laughs> you know, that I may or may not write something in the future, uh, but it's probably not going to be another ethnography of technology. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably not going to happen. Uh, for two reasons. I mean, one, I think I've ha said what I have to say. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, secondly, people who study the impact of technology on anything, right, are playing a catch up game. Right? Yeah. Uh, technology is evolving faster than we can keep up to it. And if you're an ethnographer, it becomes even more difficult to keep up with it, right? Because your projects last so long. Yeah. By the time you're done, right? <laughs> something else has come along. Something yeah. else has come along, right? And you, you get to the point, at least some people, I got to the point where I didn't think that I was ready to get deep enough into, say, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. defined by machine learning, right? Or natural language program, uh, processing to be able to actively contribute to what's being to knowledge around this right yeah this is it's time for younger people yeah to be doing this stuff now what i can do is i can if they, if people give me a chance i can talk to them about how if i was going to do an ethnography of this stuff how would i go about doing it right yeah, I can provide mentorship, but doing it myself not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, man. Well, you deserve that position for sure. Oh man. Well, Steve, this has been so great, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really grateful that we've you we finally got a chance to do it. I'm grateful for you taking you the time to talk to me. So, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions, comments, and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Peoples and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks.